This is In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. Shout out to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring the show and helping us keep the lights on. For real, set lighting is expensive. This means a lot. Tonight, how to navigate the upcoming holiday in a way that keeps family and friends safe and what the incoming administration is saying about it. Plus, with a new COVID-19 vaccine on the horizon, we look at just how effective it is and when we can expect it. But first, here's what you need to know right now. Governors from across the country are giving grim warnings as COVID cases continue to climb. I don't think any of us thought we would see an uptick like, like we have. We're at the uh, breaking point and ready to have some serious repercussions because of that. It's not safe to go out. It's not safe to have others over. It's just not safe. To try and get a grip on the situation, many leaders that previously avoided mass mandates are now enacting them. Over the last week, we've seen Utah, North Dakota, West Virginia, and Iowa all move in that direction. If Iowans don't buy into this, we lose. Businesses will close once again. More schools will be forced to go online and our healthcare system will fail and the cost in human life will be high. Other cities have also been going back into partial lockdown or advisories, and it looks like Americans are starting to stock up again. Online purchases jumped 3.1% last month. When trying to order online through Sam's Club in some parts of the country, toilet paper was out of stock. Meanwhile, Costco had a message saying the item will be unavailable through the end of the year. Though, to be clear, this doesn't mean that toilet paper is sold out everywhere, as plenty of stores and online retailers still have toilet paper in stock. It's wild to think that the Summer Olympics were ever slated for this year. Can you imagine? Mass tourism, packed stands with thousands of people all in close proximity, definitely not ideal during a pandemic. So the International Olympics Committee has been hard at work planning for next year. As of now, the games are scheduled to kick off July 23rd, 2021. But a lot hinges on an effective vaccine. If one is available, at least some fans will likely be able to attend the events as normal. The IOC president also urged the more than 10,000 athletes to get an approved vaccine, but said it is not a requirement at this time. If available, uh, then uh, we will uh, in encourage uh, then uh, the, the athletes, and not only the athletes, but uh, uh, all the participants in the, in the Games, in the particular those uh, who would live in the Olympic Village. Overall, Japan has been able to control the virus pretty well relative to the rest of the world. The country has recorded fewer than 2,000 COVID-related deaths. President-elect Joe Biden revealed a few picks for senior White House roles today, even as parts of the transition remain stalled by the current administration. Representative Cedric Richmond of Louisiana will oversee public outreach in the White House. Jennifer O'Malley Dillon, who managed the Biden presidential campaign, will be the deputy chief of staff. Steve Reschetti, a trusted confidant of Biden's who also worked with Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, will serve as a counselor to the president. White House staff positions don't require Senate confirmation, unlike Biden's cabinet secretaries, which are expected to be named in a few weeks. President-elect Joe Biden might not be in direct contact with the White House's COVID task force, but that isn't stopping him from building his own crew and addressing the coronavirus. And included in that is what people should be doing or not doing to enjoy a safe Thanksgiving holiday. Newsy's Amber Strong has more. First, the bad news. If you were planning to quarantine in order to travel for Thanksgiving Day, you've missed the 14-day mark. The good news is experts say there are still ways to safely celebrate the holiday at home. As we approach the Thanksgiving holidays, we're all thinking about how we can get together and try and feel normal. When it comes to Thanksgiving, the experts say celebrating virtually or with your immediate household is best. Bottom line. However, the CDC has put together guidelines for those who choose to gather in person, including hosting the gathering outdoors, avoiding potlucks, encouraging guests to bring food for themselves, avoiding shared items like condiment bottles, and requiring masks for all attendees. Infectious disease experts say the guidelines don't eliminate the risk. As you take that mask off and talk and eat or drink at the same time, there will still be risk that will occur during that period for the spray of aerosols or droplets. Ultimately, social distancing this holiday is the safest measure. The next best bet after a virtual gathering is to do the kind of drive-by front yard gathering that we did earlier in the pandemic. You can see one another, um, exchange those pleasantries, 
keep it at a distance with masks on. For those who choose a virtual feast, online meeting platform Zoom is waiving its 40-minute limit on free accounts on Thanksgiving Day and expanding the time families can gather safely. It's not a normal Thanksgiving. It wasn't a normal Halloween. It won't be a normal Hanukkah or Christmas. And 2020 won't be normal, period. Across the country, COVID-19 hospitalizations are on the rise. Local officials in Michigan, California, Iowa, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey are among the list of states with newly implemented restrictions on the number of people allowed to gather indoors. President-elect Joe Biden is encouraging people to follow the guidelines of small gatherings and masks. I just want to make sure that uh, we're able to be together uh, next Thanksgiving. Uh, next Christmas. Now, if you do plan to travel out of state, check the local guidelines. Many states require visitors to quarantine upon arrival. Amber Strong, Newsy, Northern Virginia. Twitter looks like it's just starting to take all of your social media accounts and just rolling them all into one. Twitter has gotten really good at rolling out things nobody asked for. Here's what's trending. In their latest edition of Try This Instead, Twitter announced Fleets, a feature that lets you post messages, pictures, or videos that disappear after 24 hours. The company said in a release, we're launching Fleets so everyone can easily join the conversation in a new way with their fleeting thoughts. The response was warm, as in people started roasting the company for rolling out their version of Instagram Stories, which was IG's version of Snapchat. The jokes are endless, but really there's a larger goal here for Twitter. The company has been making moves to evolve beyond 280 character tweets as a way to remove the pressure of jumping into social media and having everything you share be permanent. If that's the case, maybe I do have a political future after all. Okay, so having to smell your own funky breath in your mask is one of the most 2020 problems you could have, right? So how do we fix that? and kill coronavirus, mouthwash possibly has you covered for both and it can do it fast. Preliminary research from Cardiff University found that mouthwashes with 0.07% of a little ingredient called acetylpyridinium chloride or CPC show promising signs of reducing coronavirus in your saliva in as little as 30 seconds. And to be clear, it doesn't have to be Listerine. They ain't paying us, so. But before you get too excited, there's still more research that needs to be done. We should know more about mouthwash and coronavirus once clinical trials are completed in early 2021. We'll go ahead and add mouthwash to the list of things I won't be able to find in the store once we go back on lockdown. This is pretty heavy, but FBI data on hate crime killings is trending because it's record breaking in the worst way. The US saw a record high 51 hate crime killings in 2019. This is the highest number of killings since the FBI started keeping tabs in the early 1990s. One of the major incidents making up these numbers is the August 2019 shooting at an El Paso Walmart, where the shooter targeted Latinx folks. The 2019 data proves how big of a role mass shootings have played in hate-motivated killings in the past two years. But also in 2019, there was a significant increase in anti-Semitic hate crimes, which rose 14% from 2018. We should note that violent crime overall has decreased since the 90s, but the rise of hate crime killings is pretty startling, and this comes as fewer police departments actually reported this data. So just imagine what we'd see if we got a more complete picture of hate crimes in the US. Even though the US is seeing a surge in COVID cases, we are inching closer to a deliverable vaccine. Early data from Moderna shows their vaccine is well above the 70 to 75% effectiveness Dr. Fauci previously told reporters he'd feel good about when it came to a vaccine. Newsy's Lindsay Thies says the news is welcome, but doctors are still cautiously optimistic. More promising news in the COVID vaccine race. Early findings show Moderna's experimental vaccine has worked in nearly 95% of patients. This vaccine candidate uses a new gene technology called messenger RNA. When injected, the RNA enters healthy cells where it makes coronavirus spike proteins, and that prompts an immune response. Patients get two shots, an initial vaccine and a booster a few weeks later. These early findings show that of the 30,000 clinical trial vaccine volunteers, only 95 people have gotten COVID symptoms so far, and 90 of them had the placebo. Given the rate at which we're acquiring cases, we do expect that we'll have 
probably 150 or 151 cases at the final analysis. We're getting these results so quickly because there are more cases as the coronavirus spreads rapidly in the U.S. It's good for scientific research, but troubling for those at risk of getting severely ill. In about a week, there have been a million new cases, and ICU beds and staff to care for the sick patients are running very thin. We are increasing our number of beds that we have available for COVID patients really on a day-to-day -day basis. The number of patients in our ICU setting has uh, quadrupled, to say the least. We're tired of seeing the fear on the faces. We're tired of seeing people who were passing away. The country's leading infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, recommends people not abandon all public health measures, even after a vaccine is available. Even though for the general population, it might be 90 to 95 percent effective. You don't necessarily know for you how effective it is. Researchers and regulators must wait for more complete safety data from the Moderna study. That's expected later in November. Moderna then plans to ask the FDA for emergency vaccine approval in early December. Manufacturing, the drug maker's president says, will be a 24-7 operation. We hope to have about 20 million doses of the vaccine by the end of this year, by the end of the calendar year. Uh, and we're looking forward to making about 500 million to a billion doses next year. There is one big hurdle, getting people to take an approved COVID vaccine. Surveys show about half of Americans aren't sure they want to yet. Fauci says vaccination should begin in December with widespread vaccination around the second quarter of 2021. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, Denver. Here's a fun one. If you could do your same job, but somewhere else, where would that be? Newsy cuts through. With social distancing and all, uh, there aren't a lot of people around, so I've had to step in in places where I wouldn't usually step in. Um, and I've had to do the music and the sound for In The Loop. Backtracking isn't usually seen as a good thing, but I know some Big Ten fans that'll say otherwise. Here's what's trending. An unexpected reversal from the Big Ten as the college football conference now says it will go on this fall. It's super minimalist. Um, you know, just beeps and boops, you know what I'm saying? The more interesting work that I do are, uh, you know, more like Foley sounds, I mean, shutter clicks. Where's the camera, right? It's tough, um, for sure. Like, it's, it's really tough, but what are you gonna do? Like, nobody's here, like. A lot of people have found themselves working from places that aren't their offices this year. Honestly, I've been trying to find a way to film this show from the beach, but it just ain't working out like that. Plenty of folks have enjoyed that flexibility during an unenjoyable year, but working from a state where you don't reside can have a financial consequence. Newsy's Kat Sandoval explains. When the pandemic broke, work from home orders meant you were free to work from just about anywhere. But if you were one of those who packed up your laptop and phone for another state, well, you could be in for a surprise this tax season. Normally, you're taxed in your residence state where you live, but also you could be taxed wherever you're in a state where you're working. Eileen Scher, a spokeswoman for the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the AICPA, says currently 15 states and D.C. don't tax temporary teleworkers from out of state because of the pandemic. But outside of those, you may have to file returns and pay taxes outside your home state. Different states have different tax rules for remote work. Factors include how long a worker works out of state. In some states, it could be as little as one day. How much income is earned and where the home state is. You can also um, talk to your CPA and go to see, see a tax practitioner and try to help if, see if they can help you with figuring out which states you owe in. A recent AICPA and the Harris Poll found that about 4 in 10 Americans work remotely because of the pandemic. About 30 percent said they worked in a state away from their primary residence. And of the remote workers surveyed, 71 percent didn't know teleworking in another state could impact their taxes. You need to always make sure that, the, that where you're living and where you're working 
both those states have, have, are in sync and agree. AICPA is backing federal legislation to help simplify taxes during the pandemic. It would allow, again, that you would just keep your withholding the same during the pandemic as it was before the pandemic for, for state purposes. And also that el- it, the employer could elect to change it to at the actual place where, they, where the person's remote working. For Newsy, I'm Kat Sandoval. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Fleets are welcome, but tweets are preferred. I like my criticism to be permanent. As we get closer to the holidays, airlines are seeing an uptick in bookings. To try and keep travelers safe, some airports are adding in COVID-19 tests. That's in addition to those TSA pat-downs. National reporter Stephanie Stone shows us where that's happening. It's no secret that the global pandemic has turned the travel and airline industry upside down. Airport Council International North America is known as the voice of airports. I look at airports as cities within cities and anything that would affect the city would affect an airport. That's what we do. And these days, CEO Kevin Burke says it's COVID. Testing is that key that unlocks uh, travel. Tampa International Airport was the first to jump on board with a program that was the first of its kind in the nation. They offer both the PCR and rapid tests to anyone with proof of travel. We've tested more than 4,100 passengers. Um, so it's uh, it's gained in popularity. Uh, passengers know that we are providing the testing at the airport. And uh, I will tell you, before they open up at 7.30 every morning, there's 20 plus passengers waiting in line. John Tiliakos is the executive VP of airport operations and says they launched the program in early October in hopes of instilling confidence and encouraging travel. Given the environment we're in with this pandemic, um, we have got to do everything we can as an industry, both in the airline industry, the airport industry, we've got to do everything we can to breathe life back into this industry and get it back up on its feet and running again. Since then, they've fielded calls from other airports inquiring about the program. If a passenger gets a negative test, they go on about their day. But if it's positive, ACINA says it's not the airport's responsibility to escort them out. They've gotten very few passengers that have uh, been tested positive, Uh, but they've had a couple and they've had to ask them to, you know, they can't, proceed past that because TSA is not going to let them through a checkpoint with a positive um, uh, read. While an increase in testing is a good thing, doctors advise this is not a guarantee by any means. This test isn't an insurance policy for the rest of the week or the rest of the month or the rest of your life. It tells you what your status is right now. Dr. Beth Thielen is assistant professor of pediatrics at University of Minnesota Medical School, and she's an infectious disease physician. For example, if you went to a bar the night before you flew and you um, were around, you know, 100 people without masks, you potentially could be infected. But if you take a test at the airport the next day, you may very well test negative, And yet a week down the road, you may, in fact, um, develop symptoms of COVID and be capable of spreading COVID. But she says this is a start and it helps people make better decisions about what they're doing and where they're going. ACINA says the testing, masks, social distancing, hand washing, cleaning, all of it together plays an important role in getting people back on board. If our industry is going to survive and thrive when when a vaccine is there and people come back to travel, we have to take the steps now to make people comfortable, not only now, but in the future, when they're booking future travel. I'm Stephanie Stone reporting. Earlier in the pandemic, the FDA gave emergency use authorization for using convalescent plasma. That's plasma from people who have recovered from the coronavirus to treat COVID-19. But there's an issue. There is a looming shortage, and that's cause for alarm for the hundreds of thousands of people who rely on regular plasma infusions to survive. National reporter Usher Qureshi explains how the need for plasma donations is becoming more crucial by the day. My pain levels increase 
tenfold, maybe even more. Mother, wife, and rare disease advocate Deborah Vick lives with myasthenia gravis, a neuromuscular disorder that disrupts nerve to muscle communication. The messages are no longer being able to reach my muscles to make them work, whether that is to walk or move or swallow or breathe. It's all interconnected. There is no cure, so every two weeks she requires plasma infusions. Being in crisis is the worst time to have to wait for treatment. I know for me, my treatments are every two weeks, and days before my treatment starts, my breathing has become extremely labored. Many types of primary immunodeficiency disorders like VIX result in an inability to produce antibodies to fight off infection. There's about 250,000 of us in the United States alone. So. John Boyle is the president and CEO of the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Canceled drives and fear of COVID exposure, he says, have contributed to a drop in plasma donations for non-COVID therapy. This while the Red Cross says hospital distributions of convalescent plasma have increased 250 percent in November compared to September. To not meet the rising demand is one thing, but to actually have less plasma is, uh, is potentially uh, uh, very, very, very problematic. Experts say it takes 7 to 12 months to turn around plasma for patient infusion therapies. We are now nine months into the pandemic, and a crisis, say some, could be around the corner. Yes, there is a growing concern that, about the ability to meet patient clinical need. Amy Infantis is the president and CEO of the Plasma Protein Therapeutics Association. She says while the call for convalescent plasma therapies for COVID-19 has raised awareness, there is still an increased need for plasma for other rare disease patients. Our companies are making therapies every day for patients who have a perpetual need for plasma, and that is ongoing regardless of a pandemic. For those who rely on plasma donation and infusion treatment, it could be the difference between life and death. The biggest fear is not having the treatments that keep me alive. I mean, reality is, is I don't know what kind of life I will have, if any, how it will I function without my infusions. It's why so many are hoping those who can will give. I'm Usher Qureshi reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back for more in the loop tomorrow. Same time, same place. Top stories from news here headed your way right now.